Good evening, everybody. Two Witnesses Live, Watchful and I are here to chat with all you beautiful people. How are you doing tonight, Watchful? Doing pretty good. Got quite a lot of things done this weekend. <laughs> yeah, that's, it's been one of those uh, crazy, busy weekends. And yeah. I know that my, there we go. Sorry, didn't have my notes up. So, mm. what'd you do this weekend? Oh, we got, uh, we have an arena that collapsed. Um, when did that collapse? 2021 ish? A horse arena. It's a round pen with a roof. There was oh. a big snow and it caused it to cave in, which it's interesting that we thought that was the strongest structure on the property because it was a round dome. Turns out all the other all the other structures when we got that snow it was like i don't know it dumped like several feet of snow that one day huh. and everything else came through just fine even the uh, cheap dog runs that have cheaper roofs on them yeah. just fine but the uh you know the hundred thousand dollar round pin arena it collapsed so that's been collapsed for a long time we've been dealing with insurance agents trying to agency insurance trying to get the get it all sorted out and it was too dangerous for us to take down so my nephew, I was just messing around this weekend. I said, man, if you really wanted to help out, you go figure out a way to get that thing down. And he's been out there all weekend <laughs> crewing with it, determined to to get it down. And man, he has done a, a stellar job. It looks like he's got like a big part of the, the dangerous stuff down and he's got it to a point to where it like it could collapse without hurting anybody. So super well, excited good. about that. Yeah. Sounds like you super, had a weekend. Excited. Similar to my wife, she was driving home from picking up a round bale, mm -hmm. and it flew out of the back of her F-450. Ah, dang. Anybody get hurt? <laughs> no. Luckily, it was on the oh, a back road, but how would even one of those take flight? They're the size of a car. Wind can be a wind can do amazing things i mean, I mean wind is probably one of the most powerful forces on this planet wind and waves uh i watched a lot it's funny I, I for some reason on youtube i kept getting those videos that go yo the singing the, the sea song and they, yeah. they kept showing uh you know different things at sea like boats at sea there was one that was like one of those full-size carriers that carry all the cargo on them with the uh the big square containers that you can buy and like build a bomb shelter out of at your own home those huge <laughs> boats there was there was one where a great white shark was swimming up beside the boat this fin i swear almost went to the top of those containers that are like stacked up and its tail came out that thing was huge wow yeah. Um, anyway, yeah, I got distracted watching those this a bunch of those this weekend. But, squirrel, oh, what, squirrel, <laughs> what brought that up? <laughs> well, I don't know. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Just uh, curious. But we have some. Uh, we're going to go over some news. If you're good with doing mm. that, watchful. Yeah, let's some, do the news. We had some really interesting things happen. I'm not sure if you guys noticed or saw this. But a U.S. Air Force active duty service member set himself on fire in front mm. of the U.S. Embassy in Washington, D.C., uh, protest, protesting um, the genocide. As he was burning to death, he said, I will no longer be complicit in genocide. That, but I'd love to hear, guys, if what happened to the guy. Mm. So J Mod answered here. The man who filmed and live streamed the the protest was taken to a hospital with life threatening injuries. The U.S. Air Force confirmed he was an active duty airman. Wow. Mm. What what would compel you to do that though? Demon possession. I mean, that's why it was reminded me of that movie Nefarious. Is you have to be possessed with more than just an idea in order to do that to yourself. Hmm. I mean, who hurts themselves in protests of saving people who are not being endangered? There's, I, as far as I know, there is not a genocide for the Palestinians, only those who attacked, only those who are being hunted for what they did. I mean, yeah, there's still a the hundred and 
there's still 130 plus, give or minus, uh, hostages that are still being held. That they have not rescued yet. No, I understand that the bombing and stuff has been relentless and there has been a lot of civilian casualty. But here's the caveat that a lot of people are missing is that the terrorist embedded in there, first, they dress up as civilians. B, right. they, don't, they don't let the civilians leave. So they, they do it on purpose to spin the table around for the bad press. Am I saying that, you know... The um, the Israeli government is a hundred percent right in what they're doing. Definitely not. You know, it's um, it's a, a Zionist re, uh, regime, and I'm sure yeah. there's definitely some um, dark stuff going on. Who knows? Uh, you know, it's it, it's really tar- hard what to tell is truth these days. And I, you know, personally, I believe almost every world power is being ran by demons. So you don't even get yeah. me on that soapbox. It's, um, yeah, but it wouldn't surprise me if the powers that be that do these types of, uh, mind control, you know, cause we'll, we'll see a lot of these, um, active, uh, bang bang people that shoot uh, you know that light up the place and hurt people the one common denominator every one of them has when the family is talked to is that he was hearing voices acting mentally mm-hmm. unstable which reminds me of that interview that we had with Amanda so mm. you know it just right. has all, all the hallmarks of that MK ultra thing mm. it it does so I wonder if MK Ultra doesn't just open people up for possession. Because if you figure the people in control are principalities, powers of the of the rulers of the darkness of this world, if they're not putting people through this program to put them through those steps to get them to open themselves up for a demon to control them. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, it's we're living in the days of Noah. That's it's, it's yeah, what it comes that's down for to. Sure. You know, the yeah. the righteous are going to be far and few between. And yeah. I'm starting to lean towards your theory of the two witnesses being groups of people like everybody that's in this chat, everybody mm. that has grown close to Christ in the last few years, because yeah. there's there's really no gray area anymore for those who started growing close to Christ. It, it's almost been a borderline obsession where it seems like the rest, they're not worried about that. They're they're worried about the worldly things, you know, making money, whatever it is. It's just, it seems like there's a stark difference between the two. It used to be that there was a little bit of a gray area between the lukewarm, the believers, the unbelievers. But the separation and the differences between the groups is is extremely uh, stark in contrast. Yeah. So it very well could be, like you said. It seems to me that the evil is being exposed more and more, which it stands to reason that as it's being exposed, those 144,000 are being sealed, which could very well be the two witnesses. Like, I mean, just look at the the people who are, they're no longer afraid. You know, they see the evil and they're like, I'm not going to sit on my hands and not say anything. So. Yeah. But I can't control the weather and the bugs. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I mean, I see I a know. little We're critter still- and, it, it, and it won't listen. I'm like, don't go in my daughter's room and it just keeps on going. <laughs> so. <I'm, laughs> yeah, that's funny. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, the interesting thing about the interesting thing about that is. Um, there are natural processes that can cause, you know, the increase in bugs. I'm reminded of the two different cicadas, uh, where there's this weird event that's happening to where there's going to be like millions of cicadas this year. It's going to be an infestation because of just natural events and timing. And like the flies are off the chart on our farm. Uh, it's just like. I don't know. Maybe the two witnesses aren't even, maybe we've completely got them wrong. Maybe they're, you know, maybe it's the sun and the moon. I don't know. I've considered those things and they don't really fit the things that fit for the two witnesses from a purely scriptural perspective. I don't know if there's any other evidence that we can add into the equation, but what seems to fit is it is either two men or 
two two groups of people or a combination of those two things. So two men leading two groups of people. Those are like the three things that I could make an argument for from the scripture. So I don't really think that it's like angels or the sun and the moon, you know, part of creation. It seems like most, you know, when we think about what they can do, controlling the weather and the bugs, you think of Moses because, you know, the 10 plagues, right? And then you think of Elijah because of the weather. So that's where I think most people's mind goes initially. However, there is that Revelation 11, 4 that says they are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks, which that phrase right there is what keeps bringing me back to it could be two groups or two groups and two men. I don't know. I'm going to read Revelation 11 real quick, if you don't mind. Just one verse. It's yeah, about yeah. the two witnesses. It says, Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles. And they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. And I will give power to my two witnesses. And they will prophesy for 1,260 days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemy. And anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this same manner. These have power to shut the heaven, so that no rain falls in the day of their prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. I don't know, man. That wow. kind of sounds like two people. It does. Well, I mean, and going back to Moses, so Moses had the rod of Aaron. So whenever he called one of the plagues, I believe he was using the rod of Aaron. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. I, I could think be wrong, you're right. But yeah, and then Elijah had uh, the mantle. Was it the mantle? It wasn't the coat of many colors. That was that was that Jacob. Was Jacob had the coat of many colors. Yeah, Elijah had the mantle, which passed to Elisha when he was carried up in the in the fire in the uh, chariot. Uh, so it does. It sounds like two individuals, plus the fact that they're killed, right? right. To, they're they're killed, and their bodies lay in the street. So and they're clothed in sackcloth. Yep. Yeah. You know, it's something I didn't think about that you just said that you mentioned is the measuring rod. Did you say Moses mm -hmm. is the one that had the measuring rod? Yeah, he had the st the staff of Aaron, rod of Aaron. And that's what he parted the Red Sea with, right? Yeah. Huh. I wonder if Moses could be one of them. Yeah. Yeah. The measuring read, that's an interesting one. So is also the temple. So you have to ask yourself, so that temple, what is it? Is it a, is it a new temple? My assumption is that is the temple that Yeshua has been building since he ascended, because we know that he's the cornerstone. We know that we're stones built on top of him. To me, that, that's what I think of when I read measure the temple because they're measuring how many stones are built on that cornerstone of Yeshua. Yeah. And that's why I, I liken that read to, it sounds to me like that could potentially be revelations two and three that goes through where, where Yeshua goes through and he tells the seven churches, these are the things I like. These are the things I don't like. That's it's a, it's a metric for measuring, you know, it's yeah. because you can, you can put put yourself in one of those categories. Uh, you know, obviously people are going to think they're in the two categories with nothing to repent from, but it would seem <laughs> to me that during that 1,260 days, that that's very likely what their prophecy is going to be like, you know, declaring who people are and where they're at and what they need to repent from. Because it seems like the whole point of their ministry is repentance, right? I mean, what, what other purpose would they serve if they're not trying to get people to repent and come to Yeshua? That's true. You know, the way it describes this, it, let's, let's say that you're right. And the temple is, a metaphor how would this line up where it says 
um, rise and measure the temple of God the and the altar and those who worship there, but leave out the court, which is outside the temple. Do not measure yeah. it. How, how, how could that fit with the temple being like a metaphor of the temples inside us instead of it being a physical place? Well, For there it, are those... Yeah, so when you look at the when you look at the seven churches, there are th- the assumption is because they're the candlesticks that that the Son of God is holding mm-hmm. in his I think it's his right hand. Look at Revelation one twenty. I think it says that the seven candlesticks are in his right hand. So they have something to do with Yeshua, with the Son of God. That's why they're in his right hand. So these are the ones that are important to him that revolve around him that he's holding in his right hand. So it are all of them, the temple or are part of them, the temple, like maybe Philadelphia and Smyrna, the ones with nothing to repent from are the temple. And maybe the ones with things to repent from that are alive are the core are the, I don't know what the altar would be in that scenario. You know what I mean? That was the only thing that that's why I read that. Yeah. Here, let me but read. I was thinking, my, 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 I was kind of getting to the point to where maybe the ones with the stuff to repent from are the courtyard that are given to the Gentiles to trample. Because I, I'm reminded of the, the wine press of God's wrath to where the intention is to, you know, with the blood of the lamb, get the fruit out of it. You know what I mean? So it's like, yeah. and then that would line up with the, the promises to Philadelphia to where they're spared from the temptation to come temptations coming on the whole world to where maybe you know those who haven't repented go through that cycle of trampling being trampled by the gentiles so that could be the courtyard but i'm not sure about the altar that's a good one good do you mind if i read revelations 1 12 real quick yeah yeah go for it 12 or then, 20 uh, well you uh 1 12 uh well i was going to read 20 but it kind of like picks up in the middle of jesus's sentence so I oh, was sure. just going to, then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, the, the referencing John. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the son of man clothed with the garment down to the feet and girded about his chest with a golden band. His head and hair were like wool and as white as snow, and his eyes like flames of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Hmm. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And in his, I don't even know what that word is, his countenance? His countenance. There you go. Was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I live forevermore. And amen, I have the key to Hades and death. And write these things which you have seen, and the things that which are, and the things which will take place after this, the mystery of the seven stars which you have saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Yeah, so they're so he's in the midst of the seven churches. They're, they're not in his hand. It's the stars that are in his right hand, and those stars are the messengers to the churches. Hmm. Which the the common teaching on that is that the messengers to the seven churches were um, the those who were in charge of the churches in that day and time. Which I disagree with that because it doesn't make sense through the course of history. What makes more sense, and this is where I've kind of touched on this before, to where if you consider those to be actual stars up in the heavens, there are seven stars that move that uh, they're the seven planets that we can see from the earth. Uh, So it's Mercury, Venus, Mars, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, and Uranus. So all of those are visible. Five of them are visible with the naked eye. Sometimes Uranus is visible to the naked eye (laughs) under special conditions. 
Neptune is never visible by the naked eye. You have to have uh, assistance to actually see it. But the attributes of the planets actually match the attributes of the seven churches. So there's there's That's good evidence for that theory. Um, and, and I often get pushback from that because people think I'm saying, oh, are you saying they're literally the angels? Well, angel just means messenger. And in the same way that text in the Bible isn't actually you know, the people. So, you know, when you're reading about Yeshua, the text isn't literally Yeshua. It's illustrating. It's giving the message about him. Likewise, when the when the planets are moving through the solar system, God has named all the stars and given us references for what things mean. So as they're moving, they're giving messages about the seven churches. I think there is more I, there that we could that we could learn by observing those. Hey, uh, someone in the chat uh, someone I haven't seen his name before just said something that really yep. makes sense. So the churches are referenced as lampstands. He mm -hmm. says, so two lampstands are two churches which are designated as the two witnesses. Yep. Yeah, re uh, that's a Revelation 11.4, which is why I keep coming back to it. They could be uh, two groups of people. Ephesus in Philadelphia. Smyrna. Smyrna in Philadelphia. Yeah. No, yeah, Ephesus. Yeah, no, it's not Ephesus. It's Smyrna and Philadelphia. Ephesus oh. is, it's an interesting church because they're the ones that are closest to the sun if, if you line them up with the planets. So Ephesus would line up with Mercury, which is the first planet in order closest to the sun. Um, likewise, Ephesus was the first church that the disciples went to uh, when they started going two by two and when they started reaching out and building that ministry, building that church, building those churches, building the temple, uh, really is the proper way to say it, building the temple. Uh, Ephesus was the first one and they were responsible for the other six. So uh, Ephesus is um, there. What they did is all written in the book of Acts and they, they spread the gospel over all of Asia Minor in two years and three months. I think that's in Acts 2-ish. I don't know. It says it pretty early on. But yeah, Ephesus, um, they really loved God and loved their neighbor. That was the thing that they were good at and that they did. And they, they were arguably closest to the life of Yeshua because they were started by Aquila and Priscilla. Paul visited Ephesus. Um, who else? Uh, Tychicus visited Ephesus. All people, all these people who who walked with Yeshua and saw his ministry and saw what he did, they were the ones who started Ephesus. And so arguably they had the most accurate understanding. So I usually will refer to them as the churches that, you know, take accuracy really, really seriously, like Sean, for instance, studying the languages, studying the original, you know, comparing the texts, comparing the words, understanding the context and stuff like that. So, but their thing was, is they, they were, they became legalistic, most likely. That's an assumption. It doesn't say that, that they became legalistic, but his reproof of Ephesus is return to your first love or your candlestick, or I will remove your candlestick, hmm. um, which says to me that they very likely stopped loving their neighbor as themselves, which I've seen churches do this to where they start off with a with a deep love for reaching people. Um, usually early on when they're starting, they love God and they love their neighbor and they'll accept anybody regardless of the sins that have you know wrecked wreaked havoc on their lives. And but as they grow, they get more legalistic because you know a leader will be caught in adultery or you know uh, nefarious things will happen in the in the fellowships and rather than dealing with them and helping the people through their sins they begin to ostracize them and kick them out because they don't want them to have an impact on the rest of the body so rather than teaching the body to love your neighbor as yourself and help people over these these sins they 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 tend to hurt people and kick them out um i i personally have experienced that in more than one church so that's where that could just be my experience that's informing, you know, my opinion of Ephesus. But that's what I think of when I think of Ephesus. But hmm. but to your point, it was Smyrna and Philadelphia were the ones with nothing to repent from. You know, it, I didn't put two and two together. So, Mick, 
Um, haven't seen your name in the chat, but welcome. I'm glad you're here. Welcome to our family in Christ. I appreciate that um, that input because it that had not registered like that before. I know we've talked about two groups, but the way mm -hmm. he put it um, was like a lock and key in my brain. And yeah, that made a lot of sense. Then just kind of the uh, the bigger question at play is these two churches, they can, um, you know, control the weather and the bugs. When does, <laughs> when does that happen? So which one, which one would be which? So Smyrna is the church, church under crushing pressure. Uh, and Philadelphia is the church of brotherly love. So uh, when you think of Moses, he was leading the children. So the children of Israel were in bondage. They were slaves. And he needed the, the 10 plagues in order to free them uh, and bring them out of slavery from within Egypt. So would that be, that would, sounds like Smyrna to me. Now, how would Philadelphia be likened to Elijah? Because Elijah dealt with Jezebel. He was pursued by Jezebel. He was the one who got the 450 prophets of Baal to... Um, build the altar and ended up um, having them killed, which is what got Jezebel all angry about him. Hmm. Uh, we'll have to brainstorm on know. that. Yeah, we'll have to brainstorm on that one. I think the the Moses one is kind of given that, for Smyrna. That measuring breed, though, hmm. you know, that, that's a lot of, you know, that what Mick said about the two lampstands being the two churches that are the two witnesses. Mm -hmm. That was pretty good. I don't know why I didn't yeah. pick up on that before though. That would mean these two churches lay dead in the streets when the antichrist comes. Well, yeah. What's interesting about that is um, the, the assumption is, is that the two witnesses will be in Israel and when they die, they'll be dead in the streets in Israel. But how do you reach the world? How do witnesses reach the world and, and prophesy for 1,260 days in one location? The only way that that could happen is with the YouTube. Internet. And if they were being, yeah, YouTube, exactly. If they're broadcasting live, which is part of the reason why we started this channel, is in the event that we can cover that somehow and broadcast that to the world. So that's one way. But the other way is, is if they are two groups, if it's, you know, Smyrna and Philadelphia, and they're spread throughout the world, part of that 1,260 days. I mean, what if they can control the weather and bugs in each in their locations? I don't know. And then fire can come out of their mouth. And if people try to kill them, they actually die the way that they were trying to kill. The they tried witnesses. to kill them. <laughs> yeah. So if, if you try and shoot a bazooka at somebody, expect that bazooka to be shot back at you. <laughs> <laughs> interesting all right we'll have to circle back around to that um yeah that's a fun one yeah so a family and next piece of news a family in alabama sues the department of justice in alabama their son that got out of prison was missing his organs mm. so they they organ harvested his organs mm. that is just <laughs> i don't even I, I shouldn't even be laughing i just at this point that's all you can do is laugh which yeah. is i'm gonna i'm gonna cut and show this real quick give me one second if you're good with that uh, yeah yeah i i read this and i was thinking i don't know i'm kind of on the fence here like if if this is happening, like do inmates, it I guess it depends on who the inmates are that they're are harvesting organs from, but do they retain the rights to determine what happens to their organs or does the state have the right because of their, um, of their, their whatever that got them in prison in the first place, do they have the right to, I don't know, donate their body to science for, you know, research? I'm going to read it real quick. So a lawsuit filed by the Fox Nation, the only place to watch new episodes. Right. Of course it plays. I've been Yeah, you can just right click on the tab and mute the tab. Yeah. So a lawsuit filed by the family of the deceased Alabama inmate alleged sent home for burial without his heart was given way to a potential class action lawsuit 
from several more families who said their relatives' organs were also removed. Mm. Wow. The, in 2023 of December, a complaint filed on behalf of that family named as a defendant from that corrections facility, senior staff agency from Alabama Medicine conducts autopsies in prison is where families suspect their loved one's organs have been sent for educational and research purposes. I don't think for educational and research purposes is why. I'm just going to put that out there right now. I'm kind of curious what your thoughts are. Do you think they're being um, consumed? Black market, man. Do you think? No, no. Taking them and um, that's a good point. Like being sold to people who need organs? Or something more nefarious than than what you just said. I mean, I didn't even think about people uh, eating them. Yeah, but, well, I'm just thinking of like days of Noah, like witchcraft rituals. <laughs> like no, spirit no, cooking. you're absolutely right. Yeah. yeah I mean, that's kind of, that's creepy. Well, yeah, the thing that really got my attention is that they were untraceable. They interviewed some schools and the schools said that, that um, some of the students, when they found out that students, you know, some of the stuff that they were using in their medical courses was coming from the prisons. Uh, they, they protested. Um, and because of that protest, they stopped telling people where they were getting the organs from. But it, my understanding is the quantity of organs doesn't match um, just the, the medical use alone. So which tells me that it may, maybe it's a cover. Like you said, maybe there is a black market issue. Huh. Yeah, that's really fascinating. Yeah. You there? Yeah, can you hear me? Can you not hear me? Hello, hello. I was losing audio for a second. Yeah, can you hear me now? Hello? Yeah, I got you now. Let's right, see cool. here. So, what do would they eat organs as a satanic ritual? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, people eat organs when hunting as part of rituals. Uh, they definitely do do that. I got to be careful with what you say because I know YouTube's doesn't like that kind of language, but you know what we're talking about. <laughs> Hold on. I'm sorry. AirPod was acting up. Hello. Hello. I'm good now. It's, I don't know what go. happened with my AirPod, but it, it, it cut out on me. I'll, it mm. sounded like uh Charlie Brown. It was like, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Do you really think that, you know, the black market thing makes sense, but I have this sneaking suspicion that you're on the right track and I'm wrong. Mm. Ah, That's weird. It could be a combination of both. I mean, you know, they need paper trails uh, to when covering nefarious things, the same thing as money laundering. So what's the shocker here is the quantity that they are not able to trace, which if they were doing things legitimately, they would be able to tell you where everything is. The fact that that there's the inability to trace things tells you something nefarious is going on. They're either selling them or, well, they're selling them, obviously. Otherwise, there's no motivation for what, for hiding the trail. But the question Uh, is, is what are they being used for? Are they being used for witchcraft or something else? Yeah, I think you're onto something. Just my, like, discernment feeling says it's something more than black market uh, organ sales. Uh, Joyce says, what about the Adreno? No, mm-hmm. that what? to ex- to extract that, it's a very, very specific process. It has to be a child under the age of 13 or 14. Inmates from jail, that's not going to fly. Um, and they have to die in extreme fear. Um, yeah. And it has to be extracted 
at the time of that um, when it's excreted. So that uh, the adreno, then that, that wouldn't be it. But for black magic or Satan worshiping rituals, that very well could be. Yeah. Yeah, that's disgusting. It is. Um, someone said the uh, the Dumbs tunnels. Um, yeah, I mean, here's the thing about that. Uh, did anybody see the uh, the Y Files recent video on Antarctica? Man, that was good. How recent? Um, about two or three days ago. No, I didn't see that one. I saw. It seems like I saw. They do a lot of that kind of stuff with like the Anunnaki and stuff like that. I yeah. haven't seen the re- most recent one, though. Well, the, the cool thing about this one is it lines up with what Ben was saying. Mm. So they've been doing all sorts of data collection down there. And they've pulled soil samples. And Antarctica used to be the tropics. And it mm-hmm. looks like sometime between 6,000 and 12,000 years ago, there was a drastic uh, climate change just mm-hmm. like Ben describes. Yeah. And they're, f- they found pyramids down there, like pyramids really? like out in, in Egypt. They've, huh. they've removed the snow caps on some of these and yeah. they're thinking that there's some really interesting things going on down there. It's uh, you'll have to watch it. It's kind of complicated to explain, but yeah, my feeling is something is being covered up there a hundred percent for sure. Anybody that investigates that stuff ends up missing. Hmm. There was uh, interesting dozens and dozens of scientist teams that have gone down there and never to be seen again. It's interesting. Yeah. It's super interesting. Uh, that one's worth the watch. Yeah, especially because when he starts talking about the shift in climate, um, mm-hmm. it, and it sounded like just something like Ben would say, where the that continent was in like a tropical region, and within twelve hours it had shifted eight degrees to the poles. <laughs> mm. Wow! Yeah, yeah. That, that reminds me, um, can you catch me up on, uh, I know you, you talked about the China hacking and Ben's recent video. Where's the last thing we left off in regards to that hack? So sunspot or hack? Well, Ben tends to think that it was definitely the sun, but I think that the sun had a lot to do with it, but there's a component yeah. that I don't think he's considering. I think the hackers timed it with the sun to target some specific databases mm. because the there was a lot of government phones that reported that went down and Sean's inside people said that the hack used the so- solar flares as a cover and solar flares took out a lot of the other uh, components um, that went down. Mm. But they specifically went after government and law enforcement phones. And they were down for like 5 to 12 hours. And when they finally went back up, there's malware installed, they think. Mm. And uh, Well, wasn't there a balloon this weekend, too? I, I read yes. that they had sent up jets again. So <laughs> that all jives, man. I mean, like, transitions, that's, that's when you're vulnerable, is when things are happening. And... I guarantee you there are there are state actors of cyber security experts. Every country has them as part of their military and they are ready at a moment's notice to implement plans when the timing is right. So I can imagine, hey, we just had a flare take out a bunch of stuff. OK, you know, you know, execute order, you know, 33 or whatever. Yeah. And, you know, they're on it to, to start doing these things. Yeah, and today, um, Canadian law enforcement phones were hacked. <laughs> of course they were. Wow. Yeah. So, mm. from my understanding, the the CCP's uh, hacking ability is next level. And, you know, they're not reporting yep. um, really the severity of things. Yeah. 
But at some point, they're going to get it. Mm. And who knows what's going to happen. But you know, the thing that worries me, those bow things that all come from over in China, (laughs) you know, are they, are they uh, like, are they able to flip those things off to stop our communication? Has anybody Uh, ever gone, has anybody gone into the electronics of those things to those things are, they're, they're only line of sight radios though. All the, all the good ham radios like the ICOMs and the other ones, those are all Japanese made. Some of them are Mm. made in the States too, but my father, I remember him telling me because uh, his main job in the government was uh, data security for the NSA. Mm-hmm. And they had found, because a lot of the hardware components come from China. And they had found tons and tons of backdoor hardware um, things that they had snuck in. And it was so bad that they were having to do a very thorough inspection of all hardware that came from uh, that supplier. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. That's kind of the thing I wonder is like, what do they snuck in there? Is anybody, I'm I don't know. The assumption is that we're, you know, somebody's always looking, Uh, you know, there's that guy on, uh, there's that guy on YouTube who uh, tears things apart and looks at the electronics and goes through all each individual component. I wonder if he's gone into, it's not the I fix it guy. It's um, it's, it's the other guy that does that stuff. I know who you're uh, talking about. Yeah, so I'm wondering if he's gone into one of those radios to look at them. Heather said, "What about sat phones? Um, they don't sound like a bad idea. They're just expensive. <laughs> They've gotten somewhat reasonable. You can get sat phones now for two, three hundred bucks. Oh, really? I thought they were like a G." Mm-mm. Huh. No, no, they're getting they're getting pretty cost effective. I mean, the, uh, there's so many satellites up in the sky right now. People yeah. don't realize how many satellites are in our atmosphere. I mean, there's thousands upon thousands. A, a sat phone probably would suit just fine if it was a hack, though. If it's a solar flare, that is the kill mm. shot. All those satellites would be toast. Yep. Um. I, and know. that's the that that's the thing that bothers me about those devices that claim to protect against EMPs, uh-huh. is the assumption is like the like um, the Tesla for instance, you know that car deals with high voltage, uh, uh-huh. so they're unusually <laughs> uh, resilient to um, to circuit burnout. And the whole idea behind an EMP is it fries individual components. So it, it, it energizes because it's a massive amount of energy. You know, if you look at a circuit board and you've got like the resistors and the capacitors and stuff like that, that overwhelming energy that goes into those circuit boards causes the individual components to fail. And that's why it destroys electronics because it's just a massive magnetic electromagnetic wave that over energizes the the circuits so you know there's companies that will try to sell you things that say they protect against those but unless you're like wrapping things in a um, a faraday cage uh, you got to be really careful about that stuff uh, faraday well, cages because they they protect and dissipate the the electromagnetic fields um are, are your best bet for for defense against emps yeah, so a lot of people don't realize this, but your car or your truck is probably the safest place to put your stuff for EMP protection because the rubber tires actually ground everything and yep. the electrical charge will come right through the frame and go to the tires to the ground. Yep. So that that's just my two cents on it. We I studied this for a little while, but the... The big metal trash cans seem to be the best bet. I have one of those $30 metal trash cans. It's about three or four feet tall with the metal lid. And I have one closed with some uh, protective tape. I I don't even know what it's called, but it's like that fabric Faraday tape. Mm -hmm. And you can't get a cell phone call to go in or out of that thing. And that's typically what they say the best way to test it is if you can receive a signal. 
whether it's a hundred percent true, it's difficult to say, but you know, what do you do? The, yeah. So, but hard to say. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Those devices that you connect to your vehicles, I work with electronics and I imagine that it's some kind of an overcharge protection circuit, but I cannot imagine that when these EMPs have the ability to fry individual components that an overcharge, um, you know, circuit, an oversight overcharge circuit, uh, protects you from energy that is going in a path that is intended to go in. So the whole point of circuits is pathways. You have little basically roads for the electricity. When they're when the electricity is following the rules of where you want it, an overcharge circuit will protect you. But an EMP, because it's giving so much energy, it's heat and radiation and, and electromagnetic energy that is it's just going to cause the individual components to fail. So I don't yeah. I don't have a lot of stake in those uh, <laughs> those things that people sell on the uh, you know protect you from an EMP. I honestly don't even think that the EMPs are going to be as, maybe if you're in a city. Um, where who's who's most vulnerable for EMPs? I would think probably military targets. Try and take out as many military targets as you can. Yeah, the EMPs is um, kind of like not what I concern myself with the most. It's more of these massive solar flares that I think would do yeah. the most damage. But nevertheless, mm. um, the EMPs can vary depending on their height and where they're you know activated at and your actual geography of where you're at uh, will make a difference because it's going to come yeah. down at, at somewhat of an angle. My house sits in a valley that has uh, earth all around it. So uh, yeah, from my understanding, that's oh, interesting. Well, yeah. So <laughs> that, uh, that really helps and provides a natural barrier. And then, you know, you can do some other things to, better suit your odds as well. So, yeah. but I think, you know, a lot of that will have something to do with it, but you're right. They're going to target a certain specific area and depending on that area's uh, geography will depend on how greatly things are affected. Yeah. But anyways, we could probably, I'd talk say about if you're going to invest night. in that kind of thing, you're probably better <laughs> off investing in, you know, food, make sure you have three months of food on hand at all times for everybody in your house and have extra so you can feed your neighbors because there's, I guarantee you there's people around you who aren't prepared. So it's better, yeah. it's better to be able to give them a jar of peanut butter and jelly and have them still be friends with you than have somebody, you know, who hasn't prepared, who sees you as a uh, resource. Yeah. Uh, so. I have a, a broken microwave that I keep in my shop. And I keep one of my radio rigs in it because the microwave is essentially a, a Faraday cage. Smart. All right. So the next piece of news, Putin essentially mm. was talking to on state TV and said the West, which is us, is mm. ran by satanic pedophiles. <laughs> it, you know, with what we're seeing, it. I get the same sen I have the same sen sentiment. I was it you that sent me that that video on the TED Talk where they were trying to make a case for uh, why pedophiles should be treated as a sexual class. They're born that way basically, and that they shouldn't yeah. be persecuted but embraced. It's I mean, depressing. come on, who's gonna who's who in their right mind is going to approve that union with their child? I mean, that's I'm sorry, but no, that is that is spiritual right there that is not appropriate um you know even if you consider and i even hate talking about this uh, but if even if you consider the culture in in yeshua's time um you know mary was i think 14 years old when she gave birth uh to the messiah so you know they they were their marriages were much much younger in his culture but those you know, that's at the age of maturity when, you know, when um, people are going through puberty, obviously the time that God intends for those kind of unions to take place. Uh, my perception is, you know, pedophiles, that's the, yeah, I don't that's think a, that's appropriate. Let's yeah. see what old Putin has to say. Um, there's yeah. actually a video on this.
ведут против нас все более агрессивные информационные атаки. Целью выбирают, прежде всего, конечно, молодые, course, молодые поколения. И, yeah, и опять, yeah. лгут постоянно, извращают исторические факты, не прекращают нападки на нашу культуру, на русскую православную церковь, другие традиционные религиозные организации нашей страны. Посмотрите, что они делают со своими собственными народами. Разрушение семьи, They're destroying the institution of family, their cultures, historical identity, and various, various perversions. With regard to children, up to pedophilia are accepted as... I can't read <laughs> But you get the you get the point. He's he's pointing out yeah, the perversion. The audio so you can... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, wow. We'll put the. Do we have the link in the description for this? We'll put these we links in the description. We do. Yeah. I mean, he goes into details. You know, Putin. He's. He. It seems that he's um, somewhat uh, very religious. He, I, that's he the was sentiment a, I get. He was lecturing his state on how marriage is between a man and a woman. Mm -hmm. You know, taking advantage of children sexually is not good. Uh, essentially, he was calling out our powers that be on national television. Yeah, and we yeah we he he did that with Tucker. Uh, we've seen, you know, it, you might be tempted to say that it's propaganda, but it, it, he stayed pretty consistent with this. And there are people who, you know, I have friends in, in Russia um, who, who, uh, what do they say? They, how do I word, word this? <laughs> Their opinion is that it's much better than it is over here. They reiterate what his sentiment is in regards to the perversions and in, in regards to it being like the days of Noah here. Yeah. Uh, so I'm tend to believe that it's probably not propaganda, but interesting that you brought up that he said that marriage is between a man and a woman. Uh, can you see the link that I put in there where I put good follow up to LGBTQ? So this is somebody who uh, was LGBTQ and uh, had a vision uh, that saved them and got them delivered from the spirit of Jezebel. It's a it's a YouTube short and man is it so good. But the vision is what I want you guys to hear. Yeah, hold on, I'm I'm pulling it up right now. Um where uh, which one is it? It's right under the one with Putin. It says good follow up for LGBTQ. Oh, cool. I found it. Found it. Yeah, this vision is next level. I was in the LGBT community for 16 years. I was planning to have breast removal surgery. I had been taking testosterone for two years. And all of a sudden, God speaks to me. All right, let me start over. Yeah. I was in the LGBT community for 16 years. I was planning to have breast removal surgery. I had been taking testosterone for two years. And all of a sudden, God speaks to me and gives me a vision. There was a man and a woman on one side. And then on the other side, there was a man and a man and a woman and a woman. The man and the woman had babies. It was like glowing really bright. And it was like generations went down the line. And then on the other side, with the man and the man and the woman and the woman, there was a red line under their feet. And it was black because you, you can't recreate life that way. God speaks to me and he says, I made man and woman so you could recreate and share the good news of my son, Jesus Christ. But the devil is wiping out entire family bloodlines and generations of people that I intended to be born will not exist for my glory. Wow, I've been really selfish my whole life. Everything Holy in my crap. life was based on my feelings. The next day, I went to church and I got set free of the demonic spirit of Jezebel. And I didn't know anything about demons. I didn't know there was a spirit behind homosexuality. I had demons behind false identities. The devil stole my identity from a very young age. And that's why I believed I was born that way. I was in the LGBT community for 16 years. I was wow. Right? Wow. <laughs> wow. Isn't that, isn't that a hell of a testimony? Holy moly. You know, I know this is going to sound like I'm uh, an idiot, but I did not realize that there was a high probability, a possibility that homosexuality is a, a form of possession. And that makes really? so much sense. I did not know that. Yeah, yeah, that's wow. the Jezebel spirit. 
Yeah, Jezebel is in the, the Church of Thyatira. Um, so sexual sins, which includes uh, all perversions, pedophilia, homosexuality, and manipulation. Um, those, are, those are the groups that are highly manipulative. You know, they use strong language and scare tactics in order to manipulate people. And when the, that doesn't work, they entice them with lust and perversion. Wow. Yeah. That, we need to share that video with as many people as possible. That is so true. Isn't that an interesting vision? I mean, when you think about it, like that is the consequence of that lifestyle is you're snuffing out the potential children that could, that could uh, be born that you're, you're, you're that, that red line underneath their feet that you will never have any generations and any legacy of your wow. own. Wow. Yeah. That was powerful. And it's so true. Yeah. It is so true. And then it makes so much sense why our government powers are doing what they're doing. Because, you know, bottom line is they want to reduce population in the mm-hmm. best way they can. Yeah. That's the goal of the adversary. It's a seed war, right? Wants to wipe people out. Wants as few people born as uh, possible. You know, Days of Noah. I'm starting to think that, well, I know that I've been thinking this, but I'm, I'm admitting it now. Putin might be the good guy. <laughs> yeah, he might and be. our country is the bad people. Yeah. It is. It could be that you way. Know, well, one reason I say that is I shared a video about a week ago about Mount Hermon where the mm-hmm. 200 fallen angels came down out of heaven. There was a mm-hmm. lot of evidence on top of Mount Hermon from the fallen angels descent. There was like a big stone that they had uh, carved their agreement into their covenant. Mm-hmm. Anyways, it's, you can't, no one can go up there anymore. The UN built right. a building and an outpost to prevent anyone from going up there and visiting the site. Hmm. I think the UN, they are the one world power government. Could be. I yeah. just, I have it this feeling that that wouldn't is surprise so. me. Well, yeah, because you could see that, you know, kings who haven't received their kingdom yet, giving the power to the UN, uh, you know, that seems very possible for them to win that child is born. So in Revelation 12, 1, the woman who's in pain to be delivered, when that child is born and caught up to the throne, that the the adversary, the devil, the dragon is, is right there ready to devour the child. And when the child is born, the woman flees into the wilderness. That's, I believe, when that persecution begins. It wouldn't surprise me if the UN ain't that dragon. Could be. Yeah. Anybody, the, the candidates are anybody who could take over the world. Anybody who could persecute the world. And I, you know, we've heard people have visions about, you know, blue tents and fields. And that reminds me of, you know, what's come, what's going on with immigration all around the world. You know, there's fighting age people coming across the border all over the world. I just saw a comment, a flag on the map of the flat earth. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I, I'm not. I'll hold myself from commenting. Just know that when there is a rapture, the flat earthers will be the last to go. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, sorry. Should oh, I? Uh, yeah, I'll stop that. Uh, I, I just. You know, they're going to force us to do a, an entire episode on flat earth at some point. I, it's inevitable. I, I mean, uh, I can go back and forth with them at every point that they make. Um, I have it covered. It doesn't matter what scripture you reference. Yeah. Yeah. From, uh, a, for, from a scriptural perspective, I do not believe that you can prove it. Absolutely not. Because the evidence that's provided is too ambiguous for the, like the earth being unmovable. Uh, well, when they're set in their course for their orbits, you can say that it's unmovable, even though it's, it's still moving. Somebody can be unmovable in their commitment. It doesn't move. They literally, it doesn't mean they literally don't move. You know what I mean? So there's everything that they use for flat earth, I think is bunk. So you would have to have some, you know, mathematical evidence and scientific evidence to really make a good case, uh, which you, I believe that there are 
um, inconsistencies in like how our maps are drawn. So you can I go agree there. With that. Yeah. But I mean, he, so it's like, go ahead. Here's the thing. I've seen it with my own eyes. Right. Well, here's, That's, here's where, here's where I would argue with that is, so you, you, you've seen the, the, um, the earth with a curvature with your own eyes. Have you seen it simultaneously from all angles to verify that it's no globe or yeah. uh, egg or whatever we call it? I mean, like, so there's, there's kind of like one little teeny tiny thing that you could consider, like, cause I've seen it too. You know, I've seen the space stations, I've seen the videos and photos. I believe they're legit and they look like well, the earth he, is round. He, here's the thing, guys. I understand a lot of people have theories and this and that, but I've been a part of three ham radio satellite launches where my cameras were mounted to everything and I monitored the footage from the ground to the orbit and my ham radio rig behind me is connected to one of those satellites that's going around the planet on a tracker antenna following them outside. So See, <laughs> I don't know what else to say. That is really compelling evidence. That <laughs> one's hard to refute. Oh, here's the other thing. I learned this. I, a, a random math video came up on my feed. The reason why a we use 360 degrees when dividing a circle is because 100 degrees doesn't divide properly to illustrate the circle. But the because um, it can only be divided, I think it's like 12 ways, but 360 can be divided 24 ways, which anytime I hear that number 24, it gets my attention for the 24 elders because I'm always looking for another good explanation for the 24 elders. Uh, it's interesting that three, so my point being is if the 24 elders are, you know, anything. Uh, we can, you know, we might as, you know, uh, I don't know what's going on with your mic. Hello? I left it. I left it on the wrong page, man. People were staring at our show notes for 15 minutes. I think. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. I accidentally unplugged my mic. Anyway, uh, I find it interesting that 360 degrees can be divided 24 different ways, which is just another. Uh, I think that's pretty good evidence, also, that we're living on a globe and not a not a flat Earth. Yeah, it's, I'm, I'm not even going to entertain the topic anymore because I don't like division being created in our family because yeah. people that believe that they're very adamant about it. They're not flexible whatsoever. So for me, it's that's not the thing worth... is you have to be you have to be honest with the evidence. If you say something is irrefutable, it literally has to be irrefutable. If I can make an argument that refutes something that's not irrefutable. And we recently watched a video uh, where somebody kept saying things were irrefutable. And I'm like, I can make arguments against everything this guy is saying. It's only yeah, it's irrefutable a, in his. But I, yeah, I mean, I get it. I just don't like um you know, it's I don't like the vision being created in our faith, but I, I will say yeah. that guys that believe this look, you'd be calling me a liar otherwise because I've seen it with my own eyes. I've manned those cameras. The, my radio's connected to one of the satellites in orbit, so just remember that. Just food for thought, mm -hmm. and we don't have to talk anymore about that because I don't like the division that it creates, but. Guys, he made a good point, though. It doesn't matter what your belief is on many different topics when it comes to this. You have to remain open-minded when the evidence is not 100% concrete. Other than, you yeah. know, Christ is our king. And I get that. We're not flexible on that. But a lot of the translations of certain things and this and that, when there's two detrimentally opposing sides, one person's got to be wrong. So. Yeah. You know, I've been wrong many times in my life, and a lot of the time it's been with Watchful, and once he presented certain evidence and whatnot, you know, I'm like, look, I was wrong. But you can't, you can't stand on, you know, being unmovable on certain topics just because of your pride. Mm -hmm. it, it, that, that can be very dangerous. You got to be humble about everything. Yeah. Or, God, or God will humble you 
himself. That's just right. Know, just know that. Yes, sir. Anyways, so I think that's all the news. So we can talk about whatever now. <sighs> Where do we pick up on the uh, Ten Commandments? Where do we leave off? Yeah. Not the Ten Commandments, but the 613. <laughs> I think we were in Exodus right after the Ten Commandments, but I think you had me going to other chapters. Um, well, we did two. We did the commandment, so we did Revela- We did Exodus twelve. I just don't remember where we stopped in Exodus twelve. Um, and then we did uh, the pro- two prophecies being fulfilled. Did you bring by chance? Bring oh, that book I back did. I did. I did. Sweet. I did. Oh, this book is so awesome. Why don't we read from this for a little bit? We can go to the... Um, cool. I'm just going to pick a random... Man, there's so many in here. So, if you guys want to open your books to Isaiah 34, this is God's wrath against all the nations. So... Isaiah issues a call and says that the Lord's indignation is against all the nations and against their armies in particular. They are destined to be slaughtered with the sword of the Lord, verses 1 through 3. Not only will there be convulsions in the earth at this time, there will be shakings in the heaven as well. The location of this judgment against the armies of all the nations is identified as the land of Edom. Edom? Edom. I'm not sure. Verse 5. Or more specifically, the city of Basra in the land of Edom, which is now southern Jordan. And southern Jordan will become a uh, perpetual desolation Per pet, yeah. Anyways, it's messed up. Yeah. So <laughs> the uh, desolation becomes of essentially from its sins against Israel. Like Babylon, it will become a place of continuous burning and smoke, inhabited by various foul birds and animals that are characterized as desolation. It would no longer be inhabitable by man, and only the animals that eat the carcasses will live there. Yet real animals cannot live in the place of burning and because it's filled with smoke and brimstone. And mm. the two clues in this text reveal that they are not literal birds and animals. The word translated hairy goat actually means demons and goat hmm. form and the word translated night monster means night demons so like babylon jordan will also be the abode of demons where was that isaiah 34 yeah isaiah 34 and it says the segment wow. closes in verses uh, Isaiah 34, 16 through 17, with the divine affirmation, which every prophecy must have its fulfillment. And prophecies mm. that have not been fulfilled yet must be fulfilled in the future before uh, the kingdom is brought to earth. So God views every unfulfilled prophecy like a single person who has not heard of his faith or found their mate. And once the prophecy is fulfilled, that has happened. I'm not sure what Mm. that means. But the point is, the unfulfilled prophecy should not simply be uh, ignored away as if it's not in literal sense. Every prophecy must be viewed as needing to be fulfilled in the future if it has not been fulfilled yet. Whatever God commands as a prophecy will absolutely happen because the Bible has never been wrong. Wow. Hmm. So So is it saying that that prophecy has been fulfilled or that it will be fulfilled? No, it hasn't. I thought it was going to say that it had been fulfilled, but clearly it hasn't because essentially um, that part of southern Jordan will be just smoke. Um, And there will be no animals that could live there. The only thing that will be is abode for demons. Yeah, you know what? You know what? The only thing we know of that can do do something like that. Mm. Radiation, high levels of radiation. 
So some kind of most likely nuclear blast. It sounds like the uh, the one prophecy I had a dream about uh, Damascus, mm. but it's not. Oh, yeah. They're not. It's not referencing Damascus. That's a totally different prophecy. Hmm. All right. So this next one is in Isaiah thirty-five. Okay. Isaiah and Isaiah 35, it's the title of this prophecy is the restoration of Israel. Isaiah now describes the restoration of Israel and the messianic kingdom. And he points out there will be a transformation of the land. Even the desert and the rift valley will blossom and bear fruit and be productive. In the second hmm. coming of Jesus Christ, it will bring about all of these changes. Other changes include the healing of all the people in the land and all the abundance of water and the desert will turn into a blossoming oasis. Hmm. The kingdom will also include the highway of holiness, a road which only the righteous can walk. The next major segment of Isaiah is is the historical interlude concerning the crisis during the 14th year of his reign. This historical event is brought on by several other prophecies in Isaiah that these events have been fulfilled. Hmm. I'm not sure I understood that. Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 36 through 39, it says they are fulfilled. Interesting. Oh, it says they are fulfilled? Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. I wonder what the full fulfillment is. Um, it says the next major segment of Isaiah is historical interlude concerning the crisis in the 14th year of he Hezekiah's Hezekiah. reign. Hezekiah. Yeah. So this happened um, in like the 1400s, apparently. Oh, okay. Yeah. This historical event was described and has already been fulfilled. This is the first time I've really gotten into this book, so I'm not really used to how it reads yet, but okay. the prophecy, I mean, there's so much in here. Second Samuel mm. 12, 10 through 12, a promise of divine judgment. As a result of David's abuse of his royal power and, and having his family killed and taking his family's wife, Bathsheba, for himself, Nathan pronounces divine retribution against David. The, remain, er, the remainder of David's life would be characterized by warfare even with his own family. The fulfillment of this prophecy occurs when... The interactions of David's children, which eventually resulted in his full-scale rebellion against his father. I didn't know that his, yeah. they rebelled against his, uh, David. Yeah. In the same way that David had taken another man's wife in secret, David's wives would be taken from him publicly. This prophecy was fulfilled through the agency of David's son, Absalom, when during the rebellion, he took David's concubines for himself. This, Although really, Dave, this, is, this is a fun section to read. We should read this when you're done. But read it. Yeah, so um, the reason this is fun is because Nathan is sent to David and he tells him a story. Uh, and then it's then when David is angry about the story, he tells him, it's you. It's about you. <laughs> All right. So then the Lord sent Dave, Nathan, sorry, words. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David and he came to him and said to him, there were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had brought which he had bought and nourished, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. And a traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it 
before the man who had come to him. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done done this shall surely die, and he shall restore fourfold for the lamb. Because he did this thing, and because he had no pity, then Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. And he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all of Israel, before the son. And that intense? That is awesome, man. Yeah. Yeah. Man, this is an awesome book. I'm surprised I have not really dug into this yet, man. <laughs> I'm just sitting here. The overview of the tribulation. Wow. Mm. Wow, this is interesting. Huh. It's got a... a it has a chart laying out how the tribulation plays out with what mm. verses are involved, when it begins, when it ends. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of information with day counts that allow us to build those kind of charts. Uh, but the key information is missing on when they start. And that's yeah. kind of the basis for my work with the stars and trying to you know, line up and find these dates. That's one of the reasons why I say that period of 1,260 days, uh, we have a really good candidate for that coming up in April. I wonder, didn't you say around 2019, 2020, um, there was some type of agreement? Hmm. Well, Well, I'm sitting here reading, it says, um, the beginning of the tribulation, uh, 1260 days is in Daniel nine twenty seven, <laughs> And it says the status of Israel, Israel is currently protected relationship to the antichrist. There was a covenant with Israel and the antichrist. And then it says there is a temple designed. Didn't, uh, didn't Trump design a temple? Well, he designed Trump Tower. No, no, no. He, he, no, he was working on a, he offered to build the temple. You know, he built a, something else out in Israel. I think it was a embassy, a really nice embassy. But if I'm not mistaken, he offered to build uh, the temple. Yeah. So. I think you're right about that. The covenant with the Antichrist starts at the beginning of the tribulation. So what's saying that? um, This is like one of the, the original first markers that starts the very beginning of the tribulation is there's a covenant with the Antichrist. And at that same event, the temple is designed. It's not built. It's designed. So the Abraham Accords were August 13, 2020. I don't know if that's referring to that. It wasn't King Charles part of those? The Abraham Accords? I don't remember. Trump was a part of those, wasn't he? Trump was, yeah. Trump was the initiator. That was part of one of the things that, you know, him, him being the most peaceful president ever. Huh. All right, so it says the midpoint of the tribulation, Israel is persecuted. The Antichrist is corrupted and the temple is desecrated. 
invasion of Israel and the temple. Yeah, that's basing it on the on the physical temple being built. Yeah. Yeah. My my refutal to to that is the current temple that exists right now is us. We are the temple of God. Jesus is the cornerstone. We're built on that temple. So my question uh, to everybody who's who always says that, you know, when they put these timelines together when, when, when in regards to the temple is have you considered us as the temple in regards to your timeline? Because there's no doubt they're planning to prepare, to build a temple. You know, that's that's a fact. You know that you know the fact that they're preparing the heifers, they're training the priests, they have the materials ready to go, they have the land purchased. That's that's all. Those are all facts. But it's also a fact that it's not built yet. Yeah. So there's I a lot a of things. And, and no, it, it affects the time. Yeah, it affects the timeline that people assume. And a lot of these things are based on that temple, which isn't built. So my my refutal is, have you considered, you know, your your data in light of us being the temple as well? Right. So uh, that's you, all I got to say. No, you have a great point because you, you when it comes to interpreting this, you have to remain open minded at all times. As long as the scripture is not contradicted, you have to remain open minded because it's a massive puzzle. Yeah. Though I'm of the belief that the, the temple it's referencing is a physical temple, but you know, time will tell. Could be but yeah. you know, your your point is also extremely valid. Um, yeah. man, this is awesome to find there was another fulfillment of a prophecy uh this was pointed out by um nick vanderland um i was trying to find that it's supposed to be on my timeline but i don't see it here i thought it was before 2019 must have gotten deleted some oh is this it ezekiel 33 24 fulfilled yeah so this is nick vanderland um, son of man, they that inhabit those waters of the land of Israel. Didn't we literally just know we did we read Ezekiel? No, we read Isaiah 34, not 30. So this is Ezekiel 33, 24. And Nick Vanderland is saying that this was fulfilled on April 29, 2019. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I think we've talked about this before, but when Israel was formed in 1948, that was definitely one of the most important prophecies that was oh, yeah. predicted. Yep. Uh, that, you know, there's a, the translation of the fig tree entry in the Bible is essentially the, the generation that sees the formation of Israel will be the generation that sees Christ return. Hmm. Thank you, Leah, well, yeah, for thank the super chat. Thank you so much for the super chat. Yeah, so prayer, public prayer is something that we've talked about, and I understand the desire for prayer, but one of my concerns about public prayer is, you know, Jesus says, go into a closet, for the Father knows what you have need of before you ask him. And he tells us, don't be like the hypocrites who stand on the corner praying and, you know, shaking. He gives a list of stuff um, to, to get attention. So... There's a balance between, you know, not praying to be perceived as spiritual, um, but praying for needs. Um, personally, I believe that prayer is between, you know, you and the Father. And, if, and if, if someone needs prayer, it should be intimate and personal. I don't like these blanket prayers, personally. Um, I don't know, that's just my personal... My, yeah, that's just my personal feeling on it, is, is it is I'm always fighting this, and this is just personally, this fighting to be perceived as somebody better than, than you. You know what I mean? Like, we're brothers and sisters. We, we are members in particular in the household. None of us are greater than the other. Uh, so, you know, I don't want to do anything that would give any impression that we're greater than anyone else. And to me, sometimes prayer does that. It can do that. So it has to be handled tactfully and carefully. Otherwise, you fall into that category of standing on the corner trying to get attention with your prayers. So I think there's definitely a place for it. Um, 
I mean, this this is one of those areas that we just peacefully disagree on because I I think yeah. you, can, you there's no problem with praying in public. It, the more prayer, the better. But it's not worth it to me to um, yeah. debate and argue over it. But I th- I think that when there's like a, a specific need and to in order to align everybody, as long as that's the understanding that we're all getting in alignment. Like when there's a great need in the household. There's nothing more powerful than than you know multiple people praying. Um, so if we could do it in that way and and you know remain humble about it, so that it's not a show of you know like holiness, but it's you know for the intention of aligning the believing of the of the of the body of Christ. I think that's probably appropriate. Well, you know, to say what he is saying, if there's a specific prayer, someone that needs our prayer, someone in the chat that says, "Hey, look, you know my." My mom's uh, got surgery tomorrow. I find that acceptable. But yeah. what he's saying is we just don't want it to be a routine a where it seems like we're just doing it for face. Yep. You know, we're not here to put on a show when it comes to that. I have no problem with prayer either, but yep. it's not worth, um, you know, arguing over because, uh, you know, it's... It, he has a good point, so I'm I'm not going to say that he's wrong. But if someone in the chat says, hey, look, we need some prayer and there's a specific reason, I'm sure he'll be good with it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with prayer at all. It's just avoiding the appearance of evil. And that and with that and, and what would lead to that would be making it a ritual. Yeah. You know, there's a couple other um, quote, quote, biblical channels, some that I am suspicious of on YouTube. And they always start with prayer. Not that it's wrong, but it's almost like they're doing it to save face or to prove to people that they're holy. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? You know, and so. yeah. I have the same opinion about people who, you know, call themselves prophets and, you know, who who insist on giving you their resume about why you should believe them. I'm, I'm of the opinion that the truth stands alone, that if what you're saying is true, it will resonate. That Holy Spirit inside you will recognize the truth, and you don't need to tell people who you are, what ministry you have. Um, you know, I agree. Just my personal, uh, you know, I, anything to avoid the appearance of evil. Yeah, so you'll you'll find that you know maybe other people on the channel and stuff will ask for likes and subscribes, but you know we don't start our show off by saying, "Hey, look, let's pause for a second and like and subscribe." People do that naturally if they like the content. I, I yeah. feel like that you know that should just come through natural order of people like what you're providing. Same being uh, to put on a show, if you know for prayer to try to win people to stay on the show. I feel like if folks really love what you're doing, they have that natural inclination to want to be on the show and can feel uh, the Holy Spirit through what you're doing. And God can read your thoughts. He knows what you need. Yep. Now, a, a prayer for someone that needs it, I'm definitely for it. But just to do it for show, um, I kind of agree with him, but if someone says that they need prayer and we have a reason, we're totally for it. We'll never, ever say no to that. But anyways. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the scripture I'm referring to is in Matthew 6, 8, be not therefore like unto them. Wait, here, let me read the context of this. Um, read the chapter, Matthew 6 and in verse 8. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. In this manner, therefore, pray. And then he goes into the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. This prayer shapes your, me- shapes 
your, your mental thinking, because we, we should be focused on loving God and loving our neighbors. And this, this prayer focuses on forgiving others. So, you know, that's, that's how I believe uh, when it comes to prayer, God already knows what you have need of. You know, if you're, if you're, uh, you know, in a, uh, if you're under tribulation and have need, uh, you merely need to ask. Um, if you are, you know, in a situation where you need healing, he already knows you have need of it. All you have to do is ask, pray to him. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, um, somebody with a ministry of healing. You can ask uh, if you if you need help with your believing because you're not quite there yet. The one on one relationship, you know, find somebody who will pray with you and who will follow up with you the power of follow up and having somebody there who believes and, you know, has a genuine invested interest in helping you m massively important, uh, you know, um, not to keep hammering this, but, uh, <laughs> you, you know, it's just like prayers, you know, you know, when you're inviting somebody, you know, into helping your believing, that should be an intimate thing, man. It's like, that should be somebody who will take the time to love you and follow up with you and help build your believing. Because if you notice every time, I don't know about every time, but many times when Jesus performed a miracle, it was, he, he would say, it, you know, your believing has made you whole. You know, there's sometimes you're not getting deliverance because you're not mentally there where you're, you're able to even receive it. Uh, you know, sometimes it's a matter of getting where to where you need to receive it. And that's where getting, you know, somebody one-on-one -on -one to help you, you're going to get, you're going to get more power. You're going to get more deliverance out of that than, you know, just, um, a group prayer. No, you know I, what I, mean? I, I like see what you're study saying. Study group, study groups would be a really good place to do like prayer to where you could, you could take care. You could like, you know, when we get to where we have the study groups and we, you know, we have that, you know, being coordinated and, and, and managed in a way that, um, really blesses people. That would be such a good time to like, you know, to ask about people's needs. How can we get in alignment? Uh, it's just hard when we've got, you know, 600 people in the chat, 300 people in the chat. It's like, we want to, we want to take care of everybody in the chat, but well, you know, that's a lot of yeah. people. <laughs> yeah. And I don't uh, think the generic one's really doing any good. Uh, Noah asked Christopher, could you reach out to Abraham overcome Babylon? and have him on the show to discuss the 70 weeks prophecy. Uh, mm -hmm. Sure. We, we, we'd love to talk to him. Um, I won't remember that though. So if, um, email, yeah, please email me that and I'll email uh, him as well. Uh, and, your, your camera's blurry brother. Uh, there you go. Yeah. So shoot, I forget what I was saying. Anyways. Oh, prayer. We're not going to talk about, you know, beat this anymore, but I, he reminded me of something. The power of prayer is, I personally think, is all contingent on your relationship with Christ. Mm. The closer you draw to him, I feel like the stronger the miracles and the supernatural stuff happens. Because... Yeah. In the last few years, I've seen some really fascinating, beautiful things that God has done for me that I can't explain into words. I mean, it's literally, it's just incredible. You know, anytime I ask, it seems to happen. So it's, I think that working on a personal relationship with Christ matters. Not just yeah. saying that you believe and praying and whatnot. You'll feel it in your heart when you are close with him because you involve him every day, all the time with your life. You know, it's not just you go to church on Sunday and I'm not knocking folks that do that. But if you want to really see a difference in your life, in your joy, with just about everything. That that devotion where he is your best friend and he's the man that calls the direction on the map. I literally consult with him for just about everything. And you don't even have to like consult with him with words. You just 
it's almost like you're as telepathic. You just thinking what you need to do or how you're going to do it. And he responds. Yeah. So it's difficult to put in words, but just that personal relationship is so important. Yeah. He knows what you need before you even ask it. Um, you get to a point in your belief where you, 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 you recognize that both good things and bad things that happen in your life are still within his control and his power. So often when, when bad things happen, we, you know, like the arena falling, you know, when we opened up, I talked about the uh, snow that collapsed our arena that saved our, that saved us, you know, our property and our farm that happening seemed like a a, a tragedy uh, because it was an essential part of our farm. But ultimately um, the result of that, it, it kept us from losing our property. So, you know, you get to a point to where, you know, bad things happening don't phase you and you just see it. Okay, God, how is this? How are you going to turn this into good? You know, what do, what do I learn from this? You know, there's that, that saying that from Morgan Freeman of, you know, Christians, um, when, they, when they pray for things, they, they don't realize how, how they're answered. So when you pray for courage, he doesn't give you courage. He puts you in situations to be courageous. When you ask for no fear, he doesn't take away your fear. He puts you in situations to where you can, you can eliminate the fear in your life. He teaches you how to, how to get through these situations. Well so said. it's, yeah, it's just, it, it's, you know, it's a personal relationship. He knows what you have need before you even ask. And, you know, he makes the good and he creates the potential for, for evil. He does all those things. And when, when you, when you truly understand that, uh, you, you know, he doesn't do the evil in your life, but it has to be available in order for there to be good. So, and he wants that good for you. Uh, so, you know, whatever's happening in your life can always be turned to good. Huh? I'm at the, uh, yeah, like I said, I'm at that point to where it's, we just laugh at stuff when bad stuff happens. Like, oh, this is going to be fun to see how this turns out. <laughs> I know sometimes here's, that's um, really hard. Here's something that um, reminds me of something you said. It's about the Sabbath and the land. So mm. this is Exodus 12. For six days you are to do work, but on the seventh day you shall cease from labor so that your ox, your donkey may rest, and that mm-hmm. your son, your female slave, as well as the stranger residing with you, may refresh themselves. Now concerning everything that I have said to you, be careful. Do not mention the name of other gods, nor let them be heard from your mouth. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Wow. Hmm. You know, uh, I enjoy just flipping open the Bible and just seeing where God lands it. <laughs> yeah. Mine just yeah, always opens to Proverbs. <laughs> that's where I used to spend all my time. I can't tell you how many times that I've randomly just opened the book in mm-hmm. something I've been thinking about throughout the day. The answer is right in front of me in the Bible. So it's yeah. it's almost a, I enjoy doing this. I would just literally open the Bible and there will be a, it will land and answer a question that I had earlier in the day. And I'm not even thinking about it. It's just uh, yep. that personal more, relationship the, the, with Christ, guys. The more I, I do that and open up and read sections as if I am guided to those things, whether I am or I'm not, I don't know. But the more... I open up and read sections that I haven't visited in a long time. The more I see how relevant they are, it's literally as if I'm reading scripture that was written for what's going on today. You know, think of when you read about, you know, Noah and what's going on, you know, with, with the evil in the earth and the bad things happening. It's just like, man, that is just what's going on here today. And that happens all the time. Mm. Yeah. It's amazing how relevant it is. It is. So I just flipped it open and landed on Isaiah 34. God's wrath against the nations. Come near nations to hear and listen, you peoples. Let the earth and all who contains here in the world and all that springs from it. From the Lord's anger is against all the nations and his wrath against all their armies. 
He has utterly destroyed them. He has turned them over to slaughter, so that their slain will be thrown out, and their corpses will give off a foul stench, and the mountains will be drenched with their blood. Wow. Hmm. Vivid. Doesn't seem like it's going to be a good day for those folks during that wrath. Right. Well, guys, hopefully what do you guys... we won't. We we shouldn't be a part of that. That's uh, we're saved from the wrath to come. So I'm pretty sure we're saved from that. If you uh, if Yeshua is your Lord and Savior, if you've if you've washed yourself in the blood of the Lamb, you are protected from that day. Yeah. Yeah. Psalms one sixteen. Thanksgiving for the rescue from death. Love the Lord because. He hears my voice and my pleas because he has inclined to his ear to me. Therefore, I will call upon him as long as I live. The snares of death encompasses me and the tears of Sheol came upon me. I found distress and sorrow and then I called upon the name of the Lord. Please, Lord, save my life. Psalms one sixteen one. Psalms are such a good way to learn how to pray, how to pray, how to how to get your mind aligned with things that you need in your life. Yeah. All right, guys. So, do you guys have anything that questions, answers you need? We've been at it for almost two hours yet again. Mm hmm. Let's see, you guys, questions, questions, questions. I think everybody's tired. I can, everybody in the chat's going, good night, good night, good night. <laughs> yeah. Let's see here. Last opportunity. Questions, questions, questions. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't go through any commandments. We just did prophecy fulfillment. Oh, yeah. Where were we? We were in Exodus... Um, 12. You remember where? Um, I think we picked, I think it was like 12, 12. Yeah, we picked 12, 12 is where we pick up. So this is, I think the first plague where I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night. We'll strike all the firstborn. So let's see, we read, so this is the beginning of months. Um, they're to prepare a lamb, keep him for the 14th day. So this is all a parallel. This was a, a, sh- a foreshadow of Yeshua, who was going to be our lamb. Um, we left off uh, about eating the Passover. So let's, for review, we can pick up an 11. And thus you shall eat it with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. And then if you want to pick it up in 12. Sure. For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night and fatally strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from humans firstborn to animals, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will come upon you and destroy when I strike the land of Egypt. So what's really interesting about that is when you make a covenant with Yeshua, that is equivalent to washing, washing in the blood of the lamb. So you're literally putting that blood on the doorposts. And that's what causes the devourer to pass over you. That's, that's why just, you're saved. That's just awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Except you don't have to kill your, your animal in the backyard anymore and smear them on the front door of the house. Nope. You simply, no, but you can still, to... you can, you should still eat the Passover. Um, you know, adhere to this as best you can, uh, you know, just because for the remembrance, this is, this is, we do this, um, uh, because the details matter. God looks at the details. He took care of the details down to every single last thing that he said would do. And he gave us these, these festivals and these feasts for us to do in remembrance so that we're mindful of these things. It changes who you are as a person when you're mindful of these things. Yeah. 
All right, guys. Well, we had a great time with you guys tonight. My little girl's outside the door, so I have ah. to go. I'm not sure if the wife is home yet. So usually if she's knocking, that means that she's not, but I don't know. Did not hear the garage door open yet, so no biggie. Right. But man, this was fun, guys. Um, yeah. Really appreciate everybody coming out. We love being with you all the time. At the end of the night, it's the highlight of my day. Uh, Dr. Sean has a guest coming on in the morning. It's uh, a Navy SEAL friend of his. This is um, He was supposed to be on last week, but he got mm. the dates mixed up or something. But uh, that what happened. Yeah. Um, that, yeah, that's what happened. He had the dates wrong or whatnot, but Sean really speaks highly of this guy. So, um, I, I look forward to hearing what he has to say. If you guys are up, we're up, we're on at 9 a.m. Eastern standard time, 6 a.m. Pacific time. I told Sean, I said, look, please no more of these, these really early shows, but uh, yeah. I guess some of the people, um, that he talks to their early birds. Um, yeah, I don't Sean know if likes, I'll be there. Yeah. I would like to be there. I'll try to be there, but I may have to stay up all night <laughs> in <laughs> order to be there on time. We'll see. Yeah, six is really, really early for our house because most of us don't go to bed I until get it. three, three or four. Uh, yeah, I get it. How, how's the um, the app or website coming? I forgot to ask you about that stuff. Uh, I didn't do any work on Sabbath. I didn't do any work on it yesterday. Wait, today is yesterday. I'm thinking of, I didn't do anything on it today. <laughs> I was just dealing with business stuff. No um, biggie. So, but we got it in the app store. We got it working on both versions, iOS and Android. Now it's just a matter of going through the process of getting it listed in the store for, for, so we got to get it through the approval process. So once we get the uh, store listing all refined with the images and descriptions and permissions. Uh, then it has to go through them approving it, which they, they look at the code, make sure it doesn't have any viruses and it adheres to all their policies and then they approve it. That can take two to three days. Sometimes it can take months. So we want to get to that as quickly as possible so we can fix anything that they'll bring up. Okay. Don had a question. Uh, I only saw it because he put it all in capital letters. Thanks for ignoring my question. Don, first of all, we don't ignore anybody's questions, brother. There's a lot of chat coming through this. I only look over at the chat every few minutes and it's constantly moving. Anyways, yeah. he said, explain why God said firmament. It's a good question. Oh, I'm sure there's probably a better explanation um, than what I'm going to give. But you're talking about Genesis in the midst of the waters. Um, he divided the waters from the waters and he um, commanded the dry land to appear. I believe the firmament is that dry land. I could be wrong. Yeah, from my understanding, the firmament is on the edge of heaven. Um, though I have not really, um, I have never really dived or dove deep into the actual explanations of the firmament. Um, and for some reason, it's just something that I have never researched intently. I understand yeah. that it's supposed to be a separations or, or whatnot. It, but, it, it, it does interest me, but yeah, again, I've heard I've it seen, taught that, go ahead. I've heard, so I've heard it taught that. So when God said, let the uh, firmament, uh, can we read it? Cause I can't remember the wording of well, it right now. Should, should be right in Genesis. Yeah, it's just if I'm remembering words. correctly, I was taught that space, so everything above Earth, including outer space, is part of the firmament, firmament, if it's what I'm thinking of. And that there's water outside of the universe, and then there's water on the Earth. But I don't think I agree with that anymore. I think that dividing the waters from the waters is more localized. Well, here's what um, um, it was. It's Genesis 1... Six through eight, and God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so, yeah. and God called the firmament heaven. Oh, and yeah, that's what it is. And the morning that's what he calls it heaven. The, yeah. Um, it, it's. From my understanding, it is uh, the edge of heaven. And 
Yeah, but so I, what does that mean in layman's terms? Is that is that um, below our atmosphere or outside of our atmosphere in outer space? I think it's wherever heaven is, is it's the perimeter of heaven. Yeah, or is it bigger? So is it like outside of what we know as space? That's what I, I was, that's what I ta was taught that it was, is that, you know, um, all of space as we know it is from would be con confirmament, would be considered the firmament. Uh, because when you map out the wording there, um, it's basically, you know, you've got like this planet, then you got the firmament, and then you got water outside the firmaments. If you're using circles, that would mean that like the earth is the water below the firmament. And there would that would mean that there's water outside of space. But from what it seems we know about outer space and the planets and the orbits, I don't really agree with that because that would mean that the Earth is the center of the universe, and I don't think it is. Well, here's here's something interesting. Uh, the Hebrew translation of the word firmament means to stretch and spread out. Stretch mm. and spread out is the Hebrew original meaning of firmament. So, Interesting, because there's, there's that record that talks about him spreading out the heavens and the stars, I think. Yeah. He spreads them out. Yeah, so, I mean, firmament could actually be just space. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm still of the belief that heaven... We can see in the night sky every night. It's one of those little tiny stars. Oh, and yeah. I, I, I'm I like serious. That one. Yeah. yeah, yeah I like there's that so one. many NDEs that I have watched, and, you know, discernment tells me that they're not lying. But every time they went up and they left the atmosphere and they traveled at an enormously high rate of speed where it turned into a tunnel with the stars blowing by them quickly. And then after an yeah. uh, amount of time, that little tiny star grew bigger and bigger until they, they arrived. Yeah. So I, to answer so, his question, we don't know. There's a couple of good candidates from, you know, dry land to um, our atmosphere to outer space to perhaps even a, another separate location that, we see as a, uh, a star in the sky or a, a luminary in the sky, if you will. So Wendy says earth is heaven. It, it's not heaven yet, but it will be. Um, it mm. clearly states in revelations that God brings heaven to earth, to Jerusalem. If I understand that correctly, but that's my interpretation of it, that yeah. Heaven is brought to earth. Anyways, guys, we got to go. It was so awesome being here with everybody. If you want to watch Dr. Sean's show in the morning, he's here at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, I will probably look very sleepy, but <laughs> luckily he will be the one probably doing all the talking with his Navy SEAL friend. In the future, I'm going to really press the idea that we don't do these early morning shows um it's it's tough for just about everyone because at 9 a.m i am just coming back from dropping off all my kids from the morning school run like if i'm if i hit traffic on the way back i will be late for the show and sometimes i do hit traffic i literally um it's it's threading the needle so it's not that I don't want to, but you know, four kids going to four different schools, that's it's very hectic in the morning. Yeah. So that being cool. said, I, I'm going to try to see if we can do things closer to, you know, 10, 11 or 12. And just, you know, I'll just tell the boss he has to get over it because we're closed. That works on so much better for me. We're closed yeah. on Mondays anyways. Uh, really? But they... Yeah, it's the one day we're closed. So we're open Tuesday through Sunday. And huh. I, and I'm pretty much always yeah. there anyway. So, anyways, guys, have a wonderful evening. It was just fantastic being with everybody again. Those who are new to the show, remember, you know, it's a free gift. Salvation is a free gift. Christ died on the cross for everybody. Everybody, it's a free gift. And Amen. if anybody has any questions about that free gift... Email us. We don't mind helping. But everybody have a wonderful night. And we'll see you tomorrow. Goodbye. Take care. Shalom. Shalom.